Hi, welcome to this edition of Shop Talk. This week, we have Jonathan Berkowitz, the CEO of East Point Sports. Jonathan, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Happy so here's here. a question I always like to start with. It, right now, you're the CEO of East Point Sports. What did you go to college for? and What was your first job out of college? Oh, okay. Um, so I went to Brandeis University undergrad. Okay. And I was a European cultural studies major, which was, ba it was a brand new major the year I started. And it was completely made up. And, and really, it just gave me the freedom to take classes across the university. So I studied Russian. I studied Russian literature and a little bit of everything. Okay. Um, and then my first job out of school was um, in a small um, family company that sold auto glass all over the country, rare auto glass. So tell me, from there, how did the path lead to the toy business? Yeah, so it was an interesting path. So I had a number of sales roles and then I uh, wanted to try my hand at e-commerce before going to business school. Um, so I worked at Terra Lycos, which is a uh, e-com company that you know, has since come and gone, um, but got a little experience there. Went to Babson um, for a degree really focusing on entrepreneurship. And I'd always, you know, I always love toys and I'm, I'm a kid at heart still. And um, I found my way to Hasbro. And, you know, when, once I found out that Hasbro was near us, I really attacked the opportunity and found my way in there. And I, I pestered them for six months until I got in. Um, and I stayed on at Hasbro and was there for 17 years. Now, after Hasbro, you went to East Point Sports as yep. CEO. What attracted you to East Point Sports? And tell us a little bit about East Point Sports because it's a little different than toys. Sure, yeah, it's, it's definitely a little different than toys, but has some uh, commonality. Um, so East Point Sports has been around for about 10 years. And a man named Mike Nally was the founder of East Point. Um, and he had been in the industry, he had run Sportcraft before that. So been in the industry for a very long time and really was an expert in the industry. And he had built this incredible company that still was growing fast and had been growing fast over those 10 years. Um, and you know, I saw a company that had an incredible market share at mass in brick and mortar, um, but really hadn't tapped into brands, hadn't tapped into marketing, hadn't tapped into e-commerce, all the things that I know how to do. Um, and it's really been the focus of my career. So it was this amazing kind of blank slate platform to build from. So when I look at the sporting goods category, I don't see the innovation that I've seen in the toy industry. And I should say up to now, I haven't seen it. You know, I've seen some of what you're doing for next year and I'm like, wow, is it harder to innovate, to innovate within the sporting goods category? Um, so it's a great point. It's a great observation. And that's part of what attracted me to the industry too, is because when I looked at the industry and I started to dig a little deep, I realized a lot of these sports, you know, have been around for a hundred years. You look at table tennis and billiards and, and really no one's done much with them. Um, so what an amazing opportunity to bring innovation. Um, it's, I wouldn't say it's harder to do, but it's definitely different to do, um, you know, versus in the toy industry, you're looking for more toyetic kind of kitschy, fun things. A lot of times in sporting goods, there's definitely that side of it, but you definitely need to focus on performance as well. And you know, having worked on the Nerf brand, that kind of bring that thinking of performance-driven innovation has really helped. Um, and we have some amazing things coming. In respect to East Point Sports, you know, we know about what I call the bigger, bulkier sport items, the ones for outdoors or indoors, like foosball tables, air hockey tables. But you're transitioning the company to be much more. Give us, you know, a little background of where you see the company for 2022 and beyond. Definitely, definitely. So. Um, you know, one of the first things I did, um, we sat down with the leadership team. We had an offsite and we talked about what we can be. And in the past, East Point and really everyone in the recreational sporting goods industry, as, as we call it, focused on just those core sports, right? You look at your outdoor sports like badminton and volleyball and your right. indoor um, sports and games like billiards and table tennis. And that was the focus. And we really redefined what the business was all about. And the brand was all about. So our focus is going to be on active play anything with active play, where our mission is to connect people through active play. Um, the great thing about East Point and the sporting goods category is we bring people together. So sports connect people. And that's why through COVID, you know, we had such a bump because people wanted to be together and they were stuck at home and they wanted an outlet to be together. So once we redefined the business as active play, it, it showed us a lot of opportunities in places that we could go. 
So you're going to see a lot of things from more performance driven solutions around kind of core sports like volleyball um, to new games, innovation around Can Jam, which is our number one brand, um, to, to totally new things that you've never seen before in the sporting goods industry. So give us a sneak peek on what you can talk about for 2022. What are you most excited? I know there are all your kids and you love all of them, but in terms of innovation, something that I haven't seen or a new area that you're going into. Definitely. Um, so one of our uh, newest licenses we signed was with Hasbro um, mm -hmm. for Nerf laser tag. And that's a business that's near and dear to my heart, having uh, run Nerf for a long time and knowing the laser tag opportunity. Um, we went out and partnered with Hasbro and they've been a great partner and we're building a new laser tag business um, under East Point Sports. So that's very exciting. Um, another one is Can Jam. So Can Jam, as I mentioned, um, number one brand we have and one of the top brands in the entire industry. But really not a lot had been done with Can Jam. Um, it, we, East Point Sports acquired Can Jam about a year and a half ago. Um, so it's very new to the company and it was one of the things that attracted me is to build a brand in the industry. So you're going to see a lot more both in product and then competitive play that we can build social content around. And we're building that out around Can Jam. And then you're going to see some, some really breakthrough innovation just in core sports, in table tennis um, and in darts. We have what we're calling easy solutions. And that just make it easier for the consumer. So the number one pain point in those sports. What do yeah. you do with the dart board? <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting because darts, you know, people who play darts just want to play darts, right? right? They don't want the hassle of setting up a dart board. So um, a dart board to hang can actually take as much as an hour if you to do it right. Yeah, I've done that. It's painful. Yeah. It's absolutely painful. So we did all this research and we found out all the pain points. And we just found a simpler way to hang a dart board. We're calling easy hang. And it's a new solution, and literally you can hang your dartboard in five minutes. In respect to the sports category, we don't see a lot of licensing. Generally, it's like the NBA, NFL, but with some of your products, you're taking a different route. Can you tell us how you're incorporating different type of licenses within your product line? Definitely, definitely. So um, that was another thing that was very interesting to me as I came to the sporting goods industry. We all know from the toy industry how important licenses and power of, right. powerful licenses can be. Um, but it's something that was really not a focus in the sporting goods industry outside of your core league licenses. So we have the NFL license, we have the MLB license, they're great licenses, they're great partners, um, and we'll continue kind of to cherish and nurture those and really blow them out. Um, but there are different types of licenses out there that are <clears throat> could be considered a little more toyetic that offer new opportunities. So we just signed a license with Papa Shot, and Papa okay. Shot's actually the number one basketball hoop on Amazon. Um, and we're doing over the door hoops with Papa Shot. We signed a license with Ski Ball, and we're doing all new expressions of Ski Ball. Play Ski Ball, great yeah. game, great yeah. brand. Um, so those are a couple. I mentioned Nerf, and we're going to have a lot more coming. We've really built out licensing um, to be an incremental piece of our business that hadn't been there before. Looking at your line for 2022, you're also changing some of the categories that you're going in. Uh, I saw something that I call sports games, something that seems to be avoided at retail. Can you describe what led behind this innovation to really jump into this category? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So sports games is definitely a category that's been there, but it really hasn't been exploited and blown yeah. out. And there's this interesting line between sports and toy. Well, right? is, uh, is it going to fit in toys? Is it going to fit in games? Or is it going to live in both places? I think depending on the product, it could yeah. live in either place. But um, what you'll see is retail, mass retail, is doing both. So they're they're investing in kind of core sporting goods, but they're also building out sport games as an incremental piece of business because they know there's a place in between for kind of more competitive toyetic games is really what they are and active games. Um, so we have a lot coming there. I mentioned Ski Ball and Papa oh. Shot are coming there, um, but we're going to have a host of new innovations that are tabletop. One of, the, one of the things we're doing is we're taking Can Jam to the tabletop. We're going to have an indoor tabletop Can Jam for next year. So, you know, the board games business, as you know, has been on fire um, oh, with yeah. COVID and people are looking to get together. So what's better than kind of combining that with a more active play? So you can be indoors, but be active at the same time. Well, something that parents are looking at, they want kids off screens. Exactly. You know, so many parents said, I never realized how much time my kids are spending on screens when at home. Exactly, exactly. And that's the opportunity. And, and um, you know, we knew it was there. But COVID, like we said, propelled that, right? And took it to a whole new level. And that we see it just continuing to grow. So, you know, even as we come out of COVID, that's not going away. People are realizing that games give you the opportunity to connect and be active. 
So it, it's the best of all worlds and gets kids off screens. Looking at the depth of your line and some of the items, there's only so much space at retail. So how much of your business is transitioning to online versus traditional bricks and mortar? Yeah, it's, it's a great, great point. Um, so one of the other things I did um, when I came in is I made sure I got some, some market research because we really hadn't had any before. And we saw that um, the e-com space in our business is actually over 50% of the total business. So it's a very well-developed um, category for e-commerce. Um, and yet our business was not well-developed there. So it's our fastest growing piece of business. And it is um, our highest upside potential. So we have um, Walmart's an incredible partner, Target's an incredible partner, and we have a big business there. But we have a great opportunity <clears throat> to grow e-commerce and then also use our e-com marketing to drive our brick and mortar sales as well. So it's really, you know, I think retail realizes now that there's symbiosis between the two. They, they help each other. In terms of product, in terms of traditional sporting goods, which you have, we talked about foosball tables, air hockey tables. As a consumer, what should I look for if I'm looking to buy one? Because I'm looking at like cornhole. It's like, okay, what is the difference really between the sets? Yep. You know, I'm looking at foosball. How do you know which one is really better? You can read some of the reviews, but how does a consumer decide? And that's a, one of the biggest challenges in our industry. And, and honestly, that's where I'm really excited to, for my team to dig in because we have a team that's focused on, on consumer and understanding consumer. You know, if you start in the industry, if you were just to go search table tennis tables and look online and look on Amazon, it's almost impossible to, to figure out, you know, what you want to buy. You're talking about, you know, the diameter and the height of the, of the top right. of the table and trying to figure out between brands, which is which. And, you know, what we realize is a lot of the things that um, the average consumer cares about um, is not what's being marketed or what's being innovated on, right? So sometimes, you know, the the hardest thing, the, the biggest barrier for a table tennis table is getting it to fit in your home oh, yeah. or setting it up and taking it down quickly, right? When guests are coming over. So those are the things that we're looking to do. We're going to continue to innovate in kind of the core performance elements, but we're going to look for solutions that are easier for consumers to understand. An easy setup table is an easier get, right? You understand, oh, easy setup. I can take it up and put it down. And, you know, when guests are coming over, I can, I can put it away, but it'll, it'll also be a full size table when I want it. So those are the type of solutions we're looking at. How has the supply chain problems affected East Point Sports this year? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure how much you make here, how much is made overseas, yep. and especially with the larger items and the cost of containers. Uh, yeah. What kind of effect did it have on your company? Yeah, a large percent of our, uh, percentage of our products are made in China. Okay. Um, so it definitely was yeah. a challenge for us. Um, and you can imagine, you know, the, the cost per container is oh, what's been driven up crazy. Yeah. <clears throat> so when you can fit fewer items on a contain in a container, um, that's where the challenges really arise. Especially with these larger items. Right. So some billiard tables can be under 100 units per container um, versus, you know, you look at a typical board game, it can be 20,000 units per container. So it really dramatically affects um, ga table games especially. Um, so it's been a challenge for us, but... Um, the team at East Point has been amazing. We have a very nimble team, an incredible operations team. Um, the other advantage we have is we've got a 40-person office in China um, that has been with the company since the beginning in Shanghai. Um, and they're experts at sourcing and experts on the operational side as well. So we've, uh, we've worked our way through it. Um, and I would say, you know, we're going to be better coming out the other end. So I'm looking forward to next year um, because we've got a lot of solutions to uh, manage that, including domestic sourcing. So we've moved some of our sourcing to the U.S. Yeah, I've I've had a lot of people tell me their their title has gone from president to supply chain manager. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> and the other thing, people are looking at alternative sources, whether it be U.S. or Mexico, or, or just something that's a little easier to get to the U.S. Definitely. Yeah, I know more about supply chain now than. I ever could have thought I would have. Let's talk about demographics because your type of products, it's, I'm, I'm not sure who the target demos are because I love a lot of your stuff. <laughs> and it's like, I still play foosball, you know, air hockey I love, but I could also see it appropriate for a five-year-old. So it seems like you're marketing to a very wide demographic. Yes, yes. <laughs> and, I, and I think for historically in the industry, it's almost been a little bit of a crutch. So when I came in, demographics weren't really talked about because it was 
just assumed it was for everyone. Every product was for everyone. Um, so the opportunity in sporting goods is definitely to go after everyone. They're a sporting goods product for every age um, and every consumer, but there are also more opportunities to really target and understand you know, what works for an individual consumer. And it's gonna differ by sport and it differs by product. So Can Jam, as an example, um, the core target market is actually the college age kid, right? So you're okay. talking in 18 to 26, 28 is, is the core um, aspirational target, but then there's a halo for family, right? And families play it in their backyard. And we had to make some calls of you know, where we're gonna spend our marketing dollars. And for us, you know, getting after that core is the most important thing because then it drives the halo effect. Um, but then there are other sports, right? With billiards is, is an adult game and it, right, adult males are the target. So it really differs by sport and it's very important that you define exactly who the target market is for each sport because it's easy to get lost in that and forget who you're making things for. Um, so that's something that the team, again, my team has done a great job. We have a new head of marketing, a new head of product development, and they've really invested there in, in making sure the teams define exactly who the target consumer is for each sport. And depending on who that is, I'm sure marketing is very different, especially in today's world. Definitely, definitely. And there, are, you know, the, the exciting thing is there are lots of opportunities in marketing to go after. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the do perfects of the world, but also NFL and NFL sure. players. And, you know, there are a lot of aspirational uh, marketing targets that I haven't had the, the chance to partner with in the, pa in the, in the past um, that I'm excited to, especially partnering with the NFL and MLB in the leagues. Looking at some of your larger items, and we mentioned them earlier, how important is Omnichannel and how important do you think Omnichannel is going to be in the future and where you can order online and pick up? Yes, yes, it's, it's huge. It's everything. Um, you know, the biggest challenge for table games in particular, so table tennis, billiards, air hockey, is they, for the most part, they can't be merchandised in store. Most mass market uh, players carry one table game um, that you can carry. But showing the breadth and the variety is really important. And we talked about making it easier for the consumer to shop. So we're looking at things like blade signs in stores and displays in stores that will help sell the breadth of what you can get online, but also make it easier to shop. Um, because online, it can be overwhelming. When you go yeah. in and search table tennis table, you're gonna get a thousand tables, how do you choose? But if there are six and it's clearly showed out in store what the differences are, that's the advantage. So Omni is, is huge for the future of that category. Jonathan, thanks for coming to Shop Talk. Thank you. And don't forget to visit us monthly as we have new industry leaders come to talk about their businesses.